welcome back to the third and final session of our second Clean Spot Insight Forum sessions today. I'm really delighted to be able to welcome uh, our panelists to today's session. But before we do so, the background to Respect P is very much a, a cold, well, for us, the desire and passion to make sure that the work already undertaken by the Clean Spot Alliance does not just stop at the end of the project. So through the Respect P, this is how we are ensuring the sustainability of the work already undertaken, but more critically, the involvement of para athletes and athlete support personnel. So building on what Tony and Amanda have shared in terms of their evolving strategy from WADA's perspective of being athlete centred, of creating enabling environments and enabling networks, that's very much at the heart of Respect P. And as we transition from Respect through to Respect P, I'm delighted that Dr Ian Bordley from the University of Birmingham will take over as a coordinator of Respect P. And therefore, it's a great pleasure for me to hand over to Ian for this session this afternoon and for him to provide a bit of context to Respect P and the panellists that we've got before us. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, So Yeah, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the, the next project because we've got this great panel uh, with us this afternoon. So I'm keen to get on with the questions but um, and the discussion with the panel. But yeah, the Respect P is really aiming to sort of build on a lot of the work that we did with uh, the original Respect project. So um, and many of the things that we're aiming to do. OK, yeah, sorry, not sure what happened there. But yeah, I was just um, as I was just saying, you know, what we're aiming to do is just focus specifically on athlete support personnel uh, and power athletes and in terms of uh, what we've done with respect and developing a research agenda, um, doing reviews of the literature. Um, that they're two of the key things that we're aiming to do and also engaging the, the athlete's voice, but the power athlete's voice and also the voices of uh, athlete support personnel through the Respect P project. So very much, you know, what we've done a model in terms of Respect P, but now uh, transitioning the focus to um, to power athletes and athlete support personnel and that very much is in line with the uh, the panel discussion that we've got set up this afternoon in discussing the importance of research uh, uh, welcome michelle see michelle's been able to join us now that's great um so I, i'll move on now to some of the questions that we've got um for the panel and, and start our discussions uh, around this topic so you know firstly i want one of the th first uh, outputs coming from this project will be a, a review of the literature and that's ongoing at the moment and one of the things that we're seeing in that already is that there is a dearth in uh, in research literature around parasport and Ali's not in because he's, uh, he's, doing, he's just starting his PhD around this topic so he's doing a literature review at the moment and uh, that's something that he's uh, acutely aware of so one of the things that I want to ask to start with is you know why do we think that there's this uh, uh, this gap in knowledge specifically around clean sport uh, research and para sports and I think uh, I'll probably put that one to the to the para athletes first so uh, um, Patrick, Ali, I don't know who wants to start but what are your thoughts on this? Why have we got this gap in knowledge? I, I think from my point of view looking at it um, when, you, when you think about what has happened in terms of research for able-bodied communities and, and the ability of uh, researchers to gather large numbers and, and gather large uh, response sets in being a big number. Um, it's much more difficult to do that with, with para sport because generally we're training in smaller pods, we're training in smaller groups. So you have to reach out to more people. Um, and it, like if you're coming to a place within Ireland, say like, if you're looking at para canoeists within Ireland, it's n equals one. Uh, you can't you can't get a representative. Well, you can get a very representative sample, but it's not very statistically relevant. So I think that's that's a big issue for for all of the research in, in the para area. We're much more spread out, um, and, and I think that's going to be a, an issue. I suspect. Thanks, Patrick. That's a good point, Ali. I think um, for me, para sport is still kind of. Um, quite young um, and I guess it's not kind of the way it's accelerated means that research hasn't been able been able to keep up um, and also if you look at the resources that para sport has compared to able-bodied sport uh, there's still a lack of resources um, and even though there's a desire there for more research um, there needs to be more research um, kind of resources kind of plumbed in to make sure that 
you know, Parasport gets that sort of um, that recognition that it deserves. I think it, you know, the, the respect now it deserves means that it needs to, you know, have a lot more research pumped into it. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, I think that that first point from Patrick's a really interesting one in terms of sample sizes, because researchers, are, uh, particularly quantitative researchers, like large samples. So that could be, you know, one of the potential barriers that we'll need to try and think about and try and overcome when we're thinking about the research agenda in this area. And, and obviously the resources is one that we've talked about in in the previous uh, respect project as well. So it's important that we see that, that um, upregulation of resources for, for this area as well. Um, I don't know if, uh, you know, Michelle, Mike, have you anything to add on that? Why you think there might be a, a gap in, in, in knowledge in this area? Or do you think the points made by the athletes have covered everything? I'd written three things down. I'd put population size, yeah. funding and resources, and the growth of the sports. So everything the guys covered, um, particularly with the population sizes. Whilst um, whilst in my former life, when I was still in the military working at Headley Court, even in that sort of small sample where we had quite large numbers, in inverted commas, of para-athletes, getting them together, collating them, trying to communicate with them on a large scale was, was eminently difficult even with, with that collective population. So on a wider scale, of course, yeah, it's harder. But I think my um, my biggest point would have been more on the, the focus on para sport in the last 10 to 15 years has been growth and expansion of the participation. And then the focus on research has been a lot about classifications. So there's just less time, less resources then to move on. It feels like it's the next logical thing. I don't think it's something that's been missed it's just, you know, we needed to classify the athletes first to, to ensure a level playing field of competition. Obviously, this is the next step of, of level playing field. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, great points. Michelle, anything you wanted to add on this? Well, it's, it's really interesting that you're picking out one group of athletes where I come from uh, the Commonwealth Games family, where we've embraced para-athletes from the very start and... Uh, since uh, Manchester 2002, athletes um, were just athletes. And I think sometimes if you create a problem, or create a, a select group, you are actually missing the fundamental fact that um, athletes are dealt with by the same anti-doping rules. And to, to section them in some way might actually miss great opportunities to actually understand what it is that all athletes face. And then certain athletes are finding certain challenges within the anti-doping framework to achieve what your uh, ambition is in terms of, of clean sports. So I think it's, it's, Im it's important to recognise the whole context and not complicate this. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. The great points there. I mean, you, you mentioned the Commonwealth Games there and the fact that that's, you know, the one major games where para athletes or para competition and um, an able body competition happen in the same major event at the same time. And that's one of the reasons why we've chosen that sort of a, our final forum, hopefully an in-person forum by 2022, will be centred around that time because we're very keen to sort of bring these, uh, you know, to amalgamate these areas. But so kind of aware that we might be in some ways sort of sectioning um, our athletes by focusing them on this project. But I think it'll be important for us at the culmination of the project to uh, to bring all of this back together again and, and, and combine the findings from both of our projects. So, yeah, really good points. Um, so, yeah, so thanks for that. And, and welcome to Sophie, who's now been able to join us. So it's great to, to have Sophie on the panel as well. So we've got the full panel together now. Um, so what I'll do is move on to the next question now, and then uh, we'll maybe um, start with Sophie, um, uh, so, as she's not had a chance to contribute to that first one. But, yeah. um, you know, do we think it's important to involve para-athletes um, and, and obviously athlete sport personnel as well? I'll probably go to Mike for that one um, in clean sport research. And if so, um, why is that important? And also, how should we do that as well? So the, the different parts to this question. What, Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, after all, you know, the athletes are on the ground. Uh, we may see things differently to decision makers, which is why I think it's so key to have open discussions 
with all stakeholders in the form of like advisory groups to have an athlete rep, you know, asking other athletes their opinions. Thanks, Sophie. Um, Ali, Patrick, anything from an athlete perspective you want to add? Um, I think I think for me, um, if you look at the Paralympic Games in, in clean sport, um, I think when it comes to, well, in my opinion, substance doping um, and the anti-doping rule violations, they're actually quite low compared to the Olympic side. Um, and I think the biggest threat to Paralympic sport is probably classification and boosting. And I think there's hardly any research there to, well, for me, the, the trend in Paralympic sport is is them two practices that, that needs to be addressed more. Um, and you can probably argue that, you know, the lack of testing means that there probably is a lack of anti-doping rule violations. But at the moment, classification and boosting seems to be quite a big topic in parasport. And I think research needs to be um, kind of driven to that first to really protect athletes. Would you also say, Ali, that the um, fact that um, some para-athletes have um, athlete support personnel who are directly involved in their performance, like guide runners, um, there's a need to make sure that the that there's a wider um, uh, sort of collection of information. I mean, we should be testing our guide runners as much as we are testing our athletes, and and that's something that's missing from from the para movement. Well, yeah, I think if you look at um, if you do the guide runner, they're actually an extension of yourself as well. Mm -hmm. So actually, mm -hmm. you know, a guide runner could potentially be doing something that they're not supposed to, but doesn't get tested yeah. because they're not the athlete. So I think I think that that's probably a very that's a very good point actually because um, Sophie's horse is tested, so why yeah. not? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. So I think for me, from that perspective, um, whoever competes needs to be available for testing, no matter what. Yeah, and, and there's a list of like who's on the uh, field of play. I feel like everyone classified. I was on the field, the play should be tested. I think, I think as well, maybe there, there is another element of this in, in terms of the, the relationship between athletes and athlete support personnel in, in so, some of the sports uh, is quite different to what it would be in an able-bodied sport. Um, so for my own sport, say in para canoeing, not so much for me. I, I'm able to kick, pick up, carry my boat, get on, train myself. But for people with higher levels of disability, they will always have to have uh, a trainer there to get them on, get them off the water. And I think there there is a, or what I would like to see, a body of research on the potential influence, extra influence that uh, athletes support personnel can have on para-athletes in those sort of situations. Um, and it, it is something obviously that, you know, athlete support personnel leading people in the wrong direction is something that's very, very serious and needs to be be looked at. So that would be something that I would kind of highlight. I'll probably go across to, to Mike at that point because of that mention of athlete support personnel. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? In terms yeah, of Yeah, I agree completely with that. For, you know, any athlete in any sport at any level with, with athlete support personnel has this unique relationship. And from the positive side, if we're looking at driving research forward and education forward then the inclusion of those personnel not only ensure all the things that have been previously mentioned which are more the negative side but on the positive side there's this united front who are trying to drive towards the right place where we're all sort of sharing that common goal of what we're trying to achieve with clean sport mm -hmm. so it's it's the it's it's not that the athletes stand alone with the athlete personnel behind them the support personnel it's all this team effort so it needs a team and a, and a sort of community approach to to this this plan. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mike. And in terms of yeah, if we're going to actively involve um, athletes and athlete support personnel in the research process and in re research, how how is the best way of going about that? Um, probably go to the athletes first with that one. So, Ali, I think um, from my point of view, I think. A lot of athletes at the moment, they, they lack confidence in the system to even partake in research because they obviously there's a need for it and we do want research to happen. But um, it seems that 
a lot of the research is, is always based on the, the Olympic sports and able-bodied when it comes to clean sport. There's, and I think if you if the power of if the power of voice was increased within anti-doping in general, then you know you definitely can get a lot of para athletes on board. But you know, um, from the research that I've seen, you've hardly got any para athletes in that in that in that participant um, research. So I think there's a lot of ways that the, the system can actually involve para athletes. Thanks, Ali. Patrick, so if there's anything to add on that? I I, I think that. You know, I, I suppose again, I'm coming from a, a country with a small, but a small number, and it is trying to gather people together. It's trying not to be delivering this to, to one person at a time. I know, like in the run up to to Rio, we had a series of one day meetings where all of the all of the potential athletes that were were scheduled to go to the games or possibly going to the games were were present, and it, it's. We did anti-doping education at those, and I think that's that's the way to get to get it to a broader group if you can at all. The other thing is is trying to identify um, and and anti-doping agencies trying to identify champions within the para community. Um, like there are people out there who uh, are are quite vocal um, within each sport, and just to try and get them as a visible face just to try and say this is that this is a resource that's out there you know you need to educate yourself and to start trying to get them to i suppose try and get the the uh, governing bodies to to get on board from there i think that's that's how i would approach thanks patrick sophie yeah i think for me we need to look at how we engage with athletes so that goes in both in terms of research and education. You know, athletes aren't going to fill out a whole wrong survey uh, if they're asked to. Um, so how can we, you know, really engage in athletes with athletes so that they partake? You know, I mentioned education. A webinar is really the best way of educating, educating athletes. Um, if I think to my job, you know, we have education on like compliance to do with investment banking. And I think, you know, they're really good that they bring up the relevant information that we need to know. Uh, and at the end, there's a relatively easy test mm -hmm. highlighting, you know, what the athlete should know. So looking, you know, at the corporate way of educating people, I think is the, is the way to go. Thanks, Sophie. That's great. Now, I think some really good points there around you know, raising the athlete's voice and engagement. And just to sort of move across onto the, looking at athlete support personnel as well, uh, Michelle and, and, and then Mike, you know, what are your thoughts on uh, best ways of engaging athlete support personnel in, in clean sport research? I, I think Sophie raises a really pertinent point, and that is what value does the athlete really see directly from engaging in research? And, and we must see that a lot when, you know, you've purchased something and then you get a, a feedback and you think, do I really want to give feedback? You might give feedback if it's negative. And one of the problems we've got with, with researching in this area is that athletes spend a lot of their time answering people's questions, but they rarely see the uh, a direct outcome from it in terms of change. And I think that is when there's a there's going to be a problem in in engaging lots and lots of researchers in in this space and suddenly we've got we've overwhelmed our athletes and they're just beginning to think well actually where where's something changing for me and I do think it's really uh, a challenge for the researchers to be able to see change happen not just papers athletes don't see the papers you go and give at com conferences what they want to see is changes 
to the um, the impact on their lives in in terms of uh, what anti doping is really doing for them. And and to be perfectly honest, in the all the years that I've been involved, very rarely have I seen change. I mean, I advocated for education two decades ago and you know just to see now it, you know we're just getting there it's like wake up world so i think it's a real challenge for researchers thanks michelle and and mike any thoughts from you on engaging athletes support personnel and athletes in research i think i think when it's trying to engage them into research a lot mm -hmm. it's two things i would try to look at the first thing is is the so what it's what michelle alluded to it's it's the so what for me to be involved with this what's the outcome of it mm -hmm. and that's the tangible thing that comes as a result but then it's the dissemination of that information too it's 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 not just publishing research it's breaking it down into understandable layman's translation so that the the public the, the macro to micro level of people involved go okay i get why we did that research and here's what it's worth and that starts off as a little trickle but then it becomes a waterfall as as that becomes more clear because the researchers know how to pitch what they're trying to do but once you start getting success then people will be running towards the, the researchers to, to be involved <laughs> that's my that, that'd be a nice problem to have wouldn't it but i think there's some is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the aims of um, of this current project uh, uh, and the work packages involve um, some uh, focus groups with athletes and athlete support personnel. I think very much some of the issues that we're seeing discussed here are the ones that are going to be raised, but it'd be really interesting to sort of try and use that as a catalyst for engagement of athletes as well. But also what I talked about when I was discussing with Eric earlier about the, the current research agenda is that importance of uh, engaging athletes throughout the research process, not just as participants, but as active contributors um, and athletes and athlete support personnel. So your participants are involved when you're designing the research and right through until you're disseminating it. And that can, I think that will really help us with the engagement and also the translation, some of the things that um, we've talked about there. So we'll certainly be hoping to try and, and do our bit there in terms of sort of taking that co-creation approach with this. And I think just staying on the on the subject of sort of communication, but changing tax slightly, uh, I wanted to ask around about communicating information um, online. So obviously we've seen over the last year that the importance of communicating in, in information online. And also Eric spoke earlier about the knowledge exchange platform, which we'll be using again here for the uh, for the findings coming out of this project. Um, and I, I'm going to go to, to Mike first here because I know you've done a lot of work in the last year sort of as a sort of practitioner who's used to working a lot with the hands and sort of finding new ways of sort of uh, of sort of engaging in your craft but through online means which is not no easy task as a as a physiotherapist so you know what do you think are some of the best ways we could communicate and, and disseminate knowledge online i think the actual ways that the the tangible ways themselves can vary I think the approach is the key thing. It's about being brave and inventive and being being prepared to break from tradition. You know, in research, we're very good at just posting research and, and not finding ways to make it more appealing to people to A, be interested in finding out about it, but B, understanding it. So a lot of the times, personally, if, I, if I'm trying to digest and translate research to athletes, for example, then I have to put an athlete's mind to it of the so what, what does this mean to them when they read it? What are they going to take away from it? Now, there's obviously different. Sometimes then I'll take the same piece of research, but I'll disseminate it in different ways targeted for the different populations it's aimed at. So so it's more about being, you know, I think online and, and social media particularly is probably a really valid format for us to do that. Um, but I think it's about being brave, inventive, and trying new things to get that bridge to the population we're trying to reach. Thanks, Mike. And I'll, I'll go to sort of Michelle with that question as well, because I know a lot of the work you do around um, sport integrity, um, you, you engage a lot online as well. So anything that you want me to add? Well, uh, yes, we do engage a lot online, but the important thing is then, you know, athletes, they, they, they ply their trade on the field of play. And so the importance is how they translate it from the, the virtual environment into the environment where they actually are um, 
watching other athletes, into facing with other athletes in, in competitive training situations in order that they can realise the research in practice. Because we are in danger of just living a virtual world that is not really how these how athletes uh, are actually um, playing their sports. So I, I, I think it's got to go a step further. It's it's convenient. It's easy for the most part of the world. And yes, the recognition that not every part of the world, we, we have that a lot within the Commonwealth in terms of, of people who will not have access to the Internet on such a regular basis. And how do we then create something that they can go and use offline and still be able to come and feed back on it. I think those are all very important challenges. Thanks, Michelle. Another great point. Um, and, and to the athletes, anything that you would like to see in terms of uh, the way findings and important information is communicated to you? I think that the way that things are communicated it is important, but to, to a certain extent, it's less important than what's being communicated. If athletes see that it's making a difference, and the, the points that Michelle is making are, are very valid, if athletes see that it's making a difference, athletes will embrace it. So if, a, if an athlete sees, you know, uh, weird anti-doping decisions coming out and, you know, it just fading into the background rather than a situation where, you know, at least the anti-doping organization acknowledges that this this is the outcome according to the laws that we have now but it may not be what we want in the future so we're going to have to change things up if if so i think it needs to be much more open and i think that's one of the things that this this project could do would encourage more openness um from all of the anti-doping agencies so that they can say look this is where our policy is we know that it's not perfect but what steps do you want to take um, and I think if, if, if athletes could see that they had a voice and that voice had some influence, it would make a huge difference to people's engagement with the training and, and the education then, because people would want to know what's going on. Thanks, Patrick. Now, I think we've seen uh, definitely over the last two or three years a real change in, uh, in the amount the athlete voice is, um, is heard. But I think the next step is to see how that's actually influencing policy and seeing change there, isn't it? And yeah. uh, once they start to see that, then uh, I think we'll we'll see far more engagement and uh, um, happier athletes. Ali? I think for me, um, the anti-doping system seems to, well, not utilise the knowledge of athletes on the ground for when it comes to their policy making. Um, and for me, it's, it's how you communicate that clearly and simply because the anti-doping um, kind of system is complicated. It is. Uh, just look at the code um, and substances. Um, just little things like that. But, but also as well, I want the anti-doping system to actually admit fault sometimes and go, you know what? We demand strict liability of you. This is now us. We've made a mistake. We're sorry. This is how we're going to fix it. We never see that. We mm -hmm. never see them admit to mistakes. Um, but we, uh, as athletes, we are upheld to the highest of standards where the system itself isn't. And I think that's where athletes uh, struggle to have confidence in the system that you know they are protected, um, you know, to, to high standards. Thanks, Ali. Um, I'm just seeing that we've got one or two questions coming in from the audience as well. So I'm just going to move across to one or th one or two of those. I've uh, got a really interesting one. Just someone picking up on what Patrick has said about the dynamic between athlete and athlete support personnel, and potentially that sort of that power dynamic being different within para sport. Um, compared to to able body sport. I mean, is that something that we see as being particularly relevant here? Don't know, Sophie, if you want to comment first there. Yeah, um, I, I think in my sport, they very much leave it up to the athletes to join there. I think support personnel up to education. Now, I'm quite like studious and I, absolutely make sure my coach and my carer signs up to that education but I, I wonder what other athletes with carers who you know my carer helps me all the time makes me meals like she needs to be aware um, of anti-doping education uh, but it has been left up to me to make sure of that. 
And what I do think it should be the athlete's responsibility on just thinking of younger athletes. You know, do we educate parents? Uh, yeah. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, Patrick, anything you wanted to add on that? No, I mean, I, I just think, I'm not sure, it's, it's not relevant to everyone, as I say, but I think it, and I'm sure there are able-bodied athletes who have very strong relationships with their with their support personnel as well. But I suppose there is an additional factor because there are there could be other people, a bit like Sophie is saying, there could be as well as a coach, there could be somebody who's helping out with, you know, a, a physical help in terms of moving boats or moving horses or whatever that wouldn't be in the normal picture. And they need to be educated. The, the athlete and the coach and whoever else is involved need to be as one. And as, as Mike said earlier on, I think it can be a really positive voice because then you get three chances to get the positive message through. Um, and and if, if two of the three voices are making the positive, then that's the way things will go. So it is an additional advantage, but there's a risk there as well. Thanks, Patrick. Um, uh, and if I go across to uh, to Mike and then Michelle, just from the, uh, the perspective of the athlete support personnel, is that something that you've considered or you, you see being important here in terms of this dynamic? Yeah, I think, again, what I don't want to do is play down um, the relationships between athletes that aren't para-athletes because we know how crucial they are as well. But as Patrick and Sophie have said, there is that unique thing sometimes in, in the para world. Um, but I absolutely concur with everything Sophie said and, and Patrick about the the team approach where the more voices that are singing from this same song sheet and passing that same message because they'll pass it at different levels. The, you know, the athlete support worker might go and tell their professional colleagues. They might go and tell their family and friends. The athlete will work in athlete circles. So that same message is being, one, interpreted different ways by different people, but on, on the same wavelength but then just getting disseminated to all these different sort of spiders web that, that reaches out from that and I think it's a really powerful tool that we can access um, and, and they're just you know the athlete support personnel are just one part of that there's nothing special about us but we are someone where there's something there that we can do to help that message get across. Thanks Mike yeah no I think it's it's making sure that all all the cogs in the yeah are, are turning in the right direction isn't it? Um, Michelle, anything you wanted to? Well, yeah, I mean, just really to reiterate, you know, competence in in terms of the promotion of uh, uh, of clean sport and fair sport, uh, you know, is just as important as safeguarding for athlete welfare. So, if we do emphasise, as, as we know, research has shown us that emphasising the moral side of sport, the responsibility and and the the importance of uh, of sport being um, fair you know that's something you can get that team effort to and and it would be really important to change from what seems to be uh driving at the moment um anti-doping education which is education is done to you and to pick up on what you know everybody's saying here actually make us all part of uh, being able to to move the agenda forward and actually education's a reciprocal uh, thing. I mean, that's certainly how I've always felt about education. I learn as much from my students as, as I hope my students do from me. So it really is that reciprocation that needs to go on. And if we are going to enter a new era under a, an international standard, which is top down, I'm afraid you're going to lose the world uh, of sport. You're going to lose the athletes because they've got a voice and it needs to be heard. Thanks, Michelle. No, and I think that, was, that final point there is one uh, is a good example of one of the things that you said in one of your earlier comments was that there's a lot of commonality across you know para sport and uh, and non disabled sport in terms of clean sport. And I think mm -hmm. it'll be important towards the end of this project in bringing those together, as I said earlier. But I think what we've also seen through some of the responses are there are some unique elements like uh, Ali mentioned in terms of sort of boosting and classification fraud, which are mm -hmm. you know unique elements to power sport as well that need much more research attention and also some of the things we've just discussed there in terms of um, that dynamic between athlete support personnel and the athletes some of the, the ones that are unique to, to power sport but there are also ones that are you know are relevant across sport as well 
So mm -hmm. some some really good points there, I think, for us for us to take on board as a research team, I think. But just being aware of the time and uh, I realize we're not uh, we're not at the end of the, the session yet. But I want to sort of there's one question I want to sort of put to everyone before we uh, we, we finish discussions. Um, here and and this is you know what would be your number one question to be added to a clean sport research agenda specifically focused on para sports or athlete support personnel so you know th this is one of the aims of this uh, respect p project is to develop a, a research agenda in this area so we'd be really interested to to get your thoughts on what your number one question would be i think i suspect i know what ali's might be but um well we'll, we'll find out if I'm, I'm right or not but i'll go around my screen as i see people um, so I'll, I'll start with uh, Patrick. Um, I, I think one of the things that would be interesting to get an idea of, I mean, I'm conscious that in power sport there are essentially, you can break power sport down in many ways, but one of the ways you can break it is is acquired injuries or born with injuries or, you know, people who got them at very young ages or not. Mm. I, I think it would be interesting to get some feel for what people's attitude is to things like medication, TUEs, etc., as a comparison with for for maybe disabilities that do involve need that, as in, as compared with um, the the able-bodied athlete community. I think because there, you know, we do have a, a well, okay. There is a potential that we do have a very different relationship with our body and with what our body can do mm -hmm. um, and and a slightly different way of viewing and respecting the, of what we can attain with it. So I wonder whether that would come out with a slightly different view of um, boosting either medically or in, in terms of, of classification. I, there's something there. I'm not sure exactly how to phrase it, but that's something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, good points. Thanks, Patrick. Um, uh, Mike, your thoughts yeah. for your number one. I was, I, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to go for two. That was that was <laughs> tied number one. I couldn't pick one. The the selfish bit of me, the therapist in me, really wants to see some sort of analysis into sort of injury recovery. Going along the lines of what Patrick said, power athletes do have a really different relationship with their bodies. And um, in, in my experience working with power athletes, and sometimes you see the way they handle injury is different, but I'd love to have a bit more um, quantif quantitative stuff behind it to show what is that in numbers? What, how is their recovery from injury compared to, you know, m maybe a, um, a para javelin thrower compared to an able body javelin thrower? Is there a difference in a shoulder injury recovery? Is their attitudes and beliefs and behaviours that play a different part in that athlete recovery? Um, but I think from a wider scale, from a more strategic thing, I think the thing I'd always like to know more is just who are the people that we should be engaging in the research? What's the target audience? Who are the stakeholders that we should have in this research on that sort of most top down? Well, almost let's let's work out what the cart is and then put the horse in front of it instead of the other way around. So um, so let's just understand where we're trying to take this stuff and who we're taking it to. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I think that alludes back to some of the things we've talked about in terms of the importance of engaging all stakeholders, and we need to know those are um, from the outset. Ali? I think mine's um, twofold. So I think the big one for me is whether or not the current definition of doping itself should be um, redefined to factor in other forms of cheating um, to make it more Paralympic flexible, because at the moment it only focuses on substances and methods and we know in para sport there are two trends that are not in the code at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, or or um, if that if they can't do that, then should it be part of integrity instead? Should anti-doping be integrity and then have different facets like you know um, max fixing, corruption, classification in that in that organisation? So they're, they're two big questions. I'll probably ask the system at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, they're, uh, they're some pretty big questions. I think Ali, that are important to answer. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, I mean, I think Ali raises some very good issues there because uh, maybe the uh, broader definition in terms of classification, maybe even gender might be coming up uh, uh, before long. But I think I'd, I'd probably go to a very sort of simple question because I like to keep things a, a little bit simple. Um, you know, what do 
what do athletes really understand by clean sport? I'm not sure that that's got any meaning. We you throw that term about and I don't know that it's got any meaning when you see around the world how some athletes get you know, more money than others, some get more privileges than others. And, you know, I come back to those athletes who've had to actually purchase their own kit to go to games, um, pay their own fares to go to games. And uh, um, I, I think, uh, you know, it's important to really understand what we mean by clean sport, because I don't think there's a that there's one definition there. Thanks, Michelle. No, I think that's a really important point. It's what it's a question we've tried to contribute to with the uh, original respect project and one we're still continuing to try and contribute to but certainly one of the things that came out of that original project was that there's multiple uh, interpretations and definitions of clean sport and, and some people seem to use the term um, for their own advantage almost so I think it's very important that we try to start to narrow that that definition down so we know what we mean by it. Mm -hmm. uh, Sophie? Yeah, for me, um, as I was just said, I'd like to see how we can, you know, use anti-doping regulations, how they can be applied to classification, because yet again, because anti-doping is an Olympic issue, it's got a lot of funding, whereas classification is Nothing. miles behind and I'm going to go out there and say if you're going to cheat in power sport you'd be more likely to get away with it in classification than anti-doping. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah no the great great point Sophie thanks for that um, and I think there are, there's been some great questions there and, and great discussion throughout the panel um, and, and lots of you know it's always a good panel when you're left with more questions than, than you started with uh, and uh, it's left us with many questions I think for our project to try and answer and uh, or at least contribute to answering. So uh, yeah thanks to everyone. I, I, I realise on time we're getting close to the end of the uh, the end of the day here and the end of this panel but I just want to, to finish this particular session by saying thanks to all the, the panel members and uh, I'm glad we managed to get past the technical issues and get everyone on the on the panel. Um, in the end which is great because there's some fascinating discussion between everyone so thanks for your contributions um, and in terms of the the day as a whole just to sort of to wrap things up now um, I just want to thank uh, the audience uh, for their contributions and participation and hope those that haven't been able to attend live will be able to, uh, to to watch the recordings and also for anyone that's not had chance to get on the knowledge exchange platform and see the other resources that are on there and the videos that were uploaded uh, to take a look at those our project will now you know, obviously carry on and, and try to answer some of those questions that we've discussed today and we'll look forward to disseminating the findings from them. So we've got future forums planned. Um, I mentioned the one that was uh, that's in 2022 in Birmingham. Uh, there is one that was planned uh, in Munster for, for 2021. Um, I'm not sure whether that will go ahead or will be later rescheduled, but we'll, we'll see. We're all at the whim of the pandemic, I think, at the moment, aren't we? So we'll, we'll wait and see. But I hope everyone's enjoyed this uh, this online forum at least. Um, the newsletters that we've been putting out on a weekly basis will continue, so but they'll be moving to a quarterly <coughs> basis, um, so that every two or three months you'll get a, a newsletter if you're signed up for those, um, and we'll inform you of the of the updates coming out of the Respect P project. Um, and I hope to see everyone at, at future forums, um, be they online or hopefully in person. Um, and uh, yeah, just thanks to everyone for their contributions.